Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Does your new or existing business need a strong online presence? With close to 4 billion people using the internet every single day, it's imperative that your business product or service is easily found by those searching for what you offer. Welcome to My Hosting Plus, your number one online service provider. Our team of highly talented web developers and graphic designers specialize in creating eye-catching, pixel-perfect websites and graphics that are highly successful in converting leads into ongoing customers. No need to go elsewhere for web hosting, domains, professional emails, and social marketing. My Hosting Plus offers a one-stop shop experience that our clients love and appreciate. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to myhostingplus.com today and let our team elevate your business to the next level. Fringe check, fringe check, download today. Fringes is a new mobile app designed to meet, mix, and post with Torah keepers like you. That's right. How pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity? Bring it out. Fringes is available on Google Play and the App Store. Ashe, beautiful people, this is Reese Roberts. I am the host of the Entertain the Thought podcast on SoundCloud, and I want to give a tremendous shout out to Sal and Debate Talk for You Radio for providing a space where like-minded people can really come together and discuss the true state of our community as melanated people. I really want to thank you, Sal, for providing this service to the community and also for providing us access to information. That's one thing that's truly uh, assisting us in our progression as a community of people and it's just invaluable the service that you provide with your shows and all of your productions thank you so much for being who you are peace love and light from reese roberts don't touch that dial you're now listening to the big talk free radio Hey everyone, shalom, shalom, mishpacha, wahabradim. Welcome to another segment on Debate Talk for You. I will be one of your hosts for tonight. My name is Shanti. I want to say all praise, all glory, all honor to the Most High. The Lord God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This will be a special roundtable discussion. This is called Jacqueline's Troubles. Special tribute to Joy Morgan, once again, Jacqueline's Troubles. Special tribute to Joy Morgan. We will be talking about the situation that happened last week uh, concerning our sister, Joy Morgan. And we understand that some things are still unfolding. We want to send our thoughts and prayers to her family as everything is still being brought forth. And I want to bring in formally the co-host of tonight's roundtable discussion, Brother Anonymous Hebrew. Hey, hey, shalom, shalom, family. This is the Anonymous Hebrew. Uh, Thanks, sis, for introducing me. Uh, Shalom, Mr. Pekai, peace to the family. Um, Yeah, we're going to have a good discussion this evening. I look forward to hearing um, all of the minds uh, that have things to bring forward. Um, as the sister said, we will be discussing a lot of the things that we have uh, that we've heard spoken about this last week, especially, but really what's been going on for the last uh, few months here uh, with the life of the young woman Joy Joy Morgan. Uh, this is a sensitive topic, but it's also some things that we need to address. So. I look forward to having a positive discussion, especially to the panel members. As a matter of fact, peace to the Emas and to the brothers and the sisters that are on the panel. 
Um, like I said, I'm looking forward to a positive, fruitful dialogue and, uh, you know, just ready to get it started. You got it, sis. All right, all right. Without further ado, we're going to introduce the rest of our panel who will be joining us tonight. I want to first start off by introducing Sister Katrina. She can come on and formally introduce herself, and then we'll move on down the line. Oh, actually, uh, we're waiting for Katrina to call in. Okay, she hasn't called in yet. No problem. All right, Ema or Mother Maya. Hello, kids. It's Hello, family. Mother Maya here with the Tree of No Figures. We have the support of the of you. Um, our ministry is one that reaches out to produce great fruit in Israel to make the Father proud. I'm just happy to be here amongst this, amongst the, the best that I've seen in Israel with the great hearts towards the children of Israel. Um, with that, I yield. Shalom, family. Shalom. Appreciate you coming on, Mother Mother Maya. Actually, this was brought to our attention formally by Mother Maya. We did hear of some things going on through social media. However, we wanted to actually dedicate an entire show to this matter, to this situation. And thank you, Mother Maya, for uh, having it in your spirit to share the concerns that should be done. Thank you, Sal, for opening up your platform and this and this day and time. And we're going to continue. We have another Emma, another mother in Israel, uh, who's going to be on the panel as well. This is Mother Malka, or some would know as Mother Malaka. Shalom, family. I'm so happy to be here. I want to give honor to the Holy One of Israel, our rock and our redeemer. And I want to say greetings to all the family that's listening and to all the uh, sisters and brothers that are on the panel. I I count it as an honor to be here with you. So um, I'd like to uh, mention that I have a ministry called Women of the World Win. We make ourselves available to all the Daughters of Zion. So if you are in need of prayer, need in need of someone to uplift you in prayer or support you as you pray, feel free to get in touch with us um, via uh, email at womenoftheworldwind at gmail dot com. We also have a website, womenoftheworldwind dot com. And out with that, I yield. All right, family, we're going to get this thing started in in a few minutes. Once again, today's show is a special tribute to Joy Morgan. We appreciate the family that's tuning into the program, the Talk View Radio. Again, we have a lot of listeners. First and foremost, blessings to the family of uh, Sister Joy Morgan. Uh, We definitely are in hard times right now. Uh, All people on both sides, you know, and we definitely want to hear from you. If you get a chance to hear this program and you're listening to the Talk View Radio, um, but again, much blessings to the family first and foremost. But uh, Shanti has other special guests come on. But uh, you can... all right, all right. Just just for a hot second, Sal, your phone will start fluttering a little bit. Just wanted to give you that FYI. We you know sometimes right, the technical difficulties. Yeah, sometimes the technical difficulties start to to, to seep out. But the Most High will. Uh, will be done. Um, want to say uh, thank you for those listening and tuning in. I know this is somewhat a, a, a touching time, very emotional. A lot of us have concerns. A lot of us have our take, our outlook. And I do want to say again that we want to give our thoughts and our prayers to the family as the details and the evidence are still being brought forth. We understand that this is an ongoing case. We understand that there have been some some news clippings and some information in the in the news media as well as social media. However, we're just mindful of, of the, the situation, the sensitivity. However, this is a topic that we definitely know needs to be addressed in, in this day and time. And uh, we do want to want to give credence though to to one of the 
one of the mothers who brought this to life um, as we were all man up last Wednesday. Things were unfolding, and a lot of um, a lot of opinions and thoughts were going forth on social media. So, uh, if if uh, sister or mother <clears throat> mother Maya wants to run down a little bit of the, the situation, a little bit of the story, a little bit of the background, and uh, I'll go ahead and relinquish the mic to her. Mother Maya, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm here. I had a little bit going on in the background. and to get situated. Could you repeat that again? I'm so sorry. No problem. I just want to make sure that the people have a backdrop of the, the story of what transpired last week, according uh, according to the news media, about our sister Joy Morgan, a little bit of what, what you have as far as, you know, the, the, the people who have been talking to the family or, you know, all of the, any of the info we have thus far. Do you want to give a backdrop of the story or enlighten, or enlighten the audience, please, of, of the backstory? Okay, I'll do what I can. I was definitely, um, you know, waiting on the guest that I had contacted, um, Brother Matatua, um, that will be joining us. But he has really great, you know, in-depth. But, you know, we um, we are here because we know in the Israel community, we lost. Uh, we have not been able to put our hands on a daughter of Zion. And um, she was young, about 20, 21 years old. Um, she was with the camp, I think, IURC out of UK. And um, they was like they, the last that they seen her was, I believe, December 26th. Um, and since that time, we know that there was a gentleman that is involved. Um, the news media has put out reports that <clears throat> that he was charged with murder. And um, but nevertheless. Where we are now, you know, that sent the chills down the um, children of Israel because there were so many things that was going on when the information hit over here in the state. Where is Joy, Joy Morgan? And so many of us out here, our hearts dropped, prayers went out, you know. We even saw that on Facebook. Some started fasting for her return. And um, nevertheless, with me, I know I was out taking care of business when um, someone hit me in my inbox and said that she was murdered. So, you know, my heart went down, and I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, I'll tears came to my eyes because this young lady is like no more than about two, three years younger than my youngest daughter. So, you know, there we start to travail to find out. We don't know what happened. There's different reports. So, you know, we're being patient in that area. But for me, with the tree of no fig leaves, where our concern is always is to reach out and touch the hurting. Um, so that's what the journey, what we want to do. We was trying to find out. How can we touch this family? Because, we, you know, we saw the reports in the news where the mother was crying out with a, with a phone, on um, speaker phone. And, we, you know, our, our hearts were hurting because, you know, we're not, we know that we're out here. We're not part of IUIC, but we definitely didn't want um, the mother to know, um, to think that there was no other saints out here whose heart was hurting with her for her daughter. We have, a lot of us have daughters, even if we don't have to have a daughter. Just having the spirit of the Messiah will cause you to promise to your need to hear such news. Um, so that's what we, that's the mission we went on. Uh, matter of fact, Sister uh, Malaka's on here. Um, she was um, uh, one of the ones that came on the girl just without ministry when we got in contact with Me Too Demona. We were full force behind that. Uh, we touched the young girls, we touched the young girls in that situation. I think she came on and prayed with us on our ministry. So, like I say, our avenue was to reach out. We couldn't worry about the details of what, what happened, what did not. You know, we're not sure of, you know, their reports. I've been updated. You know, nobody has been found. So um, we're between mourning, um, our dear sister Joy, or welcoming a celebration. So with that, part, we're just being patient and letting the Holy Spirit and the Father do their work and let it be revealed. The truth will come out in the end. But nevertheless, um, on our journey, we just been, um, it was just so heavy on my heart that you know I'm always a supporter of you, uh, Santi Dog. You know, wherever you are, you know, I'm trying to be here. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm your biggest fan. I'm like, look, I got to go be on this show. And nevertheless, I did not know that night that you all were kind of going in this avenue because the spirit in um, Israel at that point was very, very somber. So, you know, after the uh, ministry, I was like, you know, um, I, when I put it out, I was like, you know, are we going to maybe do something as a tribute to this young girl? And at that point in time, I wasn't aware that nobody had been found. Um, nevertheless, I was just in the spirit that she was no longer with us. And, um, you know, so therefore it took a life of its own. So I'm going doing what I do, what the Holy Spirit do me, you know, 
leads me and guides me to do, to reach out, touch this one, touch that one, because at the end of the day, we're really trying to touch this family to let them know that we, you know, our love and our heart and our support is behind them full force. They mourn, we mourn. Uh, one daughter of Zion is lost. All daughters of Zion is affected. And um, so I was able to, you know, through the um, networking through Facebook Street, I'm going to call it that, I was able to reach out and tap a brother, Caleb Emmanuel Israel, um, who was really nice to me because I knew I could not just go and directly deal with the family because there was a sense of distrust in Israel. But um, we could see, you know, the way the things went down. We could see the mother was frustrated. I mean, she's on TV, you know, national news, putting her phone out with the speaker phone, calling IUIC. We just, we seen a lot go down. And I know just coming at her like that, they don't know who to trust at that point, and I did not want to navigate that wrong way and offend anyone, though my intentions were pure. So nevertheless, um, Holy Spirit let me to a young gentleman by the name of Caleb Emmanuel Israel. He did put me in touch with a chalkman Israel. We was trying to really hope we could get uh, maybe touch a daughter of Zion with the Rota, and that is the one that is in charge of the um, GoFundMe for um, our dear sister Joy. But nevertheless, Chalkman Israel was real kind to me. He, um, he answered my questions, which was, I want to, our ministry wanted to know how could we reach out and bless the family besides GoFundMe because, you know, we know money is of the pressing issue, but we had already donated. But we wanted to be able to do something extra, which was that's what we do because that's the way our hearts, you know, work over here. And um, nevertheless, through um, Brother Chalkman, you know, navigating through his, through the Facebook streets of his um, news feed, I was able to tap onto um, a brother named Makatawa, who um, goes by the name of Zion Awaits, and um, he's the one that I found out that was in the really the closest contact. I, what I think so far, I could be mistaken, but from what I've seen, as that's all I'm going on, um, he's been dealing one-on-one with um, Sister Joyce's um, sister. Um, let me see. I believe her name is um, Charmaine M. Cyrus. And um, I got so many positive vibes by him, and I've been seeing how he's been a foot soldier out here trying to get to the bottom of it. So there's some murkiness I've seen that occur, but nevertheless, um, through the Holy Spirit, I'm seeing that part settle down because of me watching him from afar. I've seen that his heart and his intentions are surely pure. Um, nevertheless, was able to um, garner through the brother, Chakam Israel, how we were able to reach out into the family and send the gift that um, that was pressing on our hearts to give. And, um, you know, this is not the first time, you know, we've been on this run with the um, ministry. Nevertheless, um, the ministry I had before this was called True True Productions. And it was a spiritual ministry. It was, it, you know, it was like a spiritual church. We, were a church. we would go around and bring the Bible to life. So we would get children off the street, dress them in garments and what have you, whatever the Holy Spirit leads us. And God says that's what we did. And I'll never forget back in, like, February 2010, that's when the Holy Spirit, you know, came. And I just, I knew that that was the day um, I did even remember being born again. And after that, I just I took the Isaiah call and was like, Father, you know, send me. I'll go tell them. I'll go stare men in their ugly faces and tell them about what your son has done. I am not afraid. So, nevertheless, we went off onto that ministry, and uh, we were performing um, the Last Supper. i never forget. And uh, we were in a... A black church at that point, I wasn't awakening to the truth. All I knew was I was a baby, and I wanted to do something for that man who had sent his son and the son who had came and died and shed his precious blood on Calvary for the remission of my sin, a sinner, a wretch undone. So we were trying to do, get this play together, and I was asking, the, you know, the black people in the church, we need your sons because it was in February, and it was Black History Month. And the Holy Spirit came over me to play Harriet Tubman, and so all I needed was the children to come through the door and say, "We're." And I, and it was, it was so hurtful to me because I couldn't get any cooperation. They were telling me, you know, my son is, and my children are not going to pay no slave with you. And I was like, really, you know, I'm, I'm a baby, and I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, I thought I came. So nevertheless, nothing stops the train. So my son was in, um college in Miami at that time. So he got his friend, and they jumped on the train. They came down. Matter of fact, his girlfriend's stepbrother was in town, so we needed more disciples to play, you know, the role of the disciples. We were trying to come up with 12 young men. We didn't get them all, but we got enough. Nevertheless, the thing about it, they came in last minute. I'm trying to get up strips to remember. And they all, you know, they were excited. You know, they, they, they told me they had never, they couldn't believe that they was in 
you know, these type of uniforms, you know, they was just, you could see the light in these young men's eyes, you know, as we donned them to be disciples that night. So they came in that night, and um, I gave them the part at the end when the Christ was crucified, which is my son. He was up there on the, what we call the cross, and I had them each want to go up and say their lines. And um, this guy, the young guy I'm talking about, he ended up with James the Lesser. So he couldn't come up with any lines. I said, you know what, son, whatever the Holy Spirit gives you when you go up to that cross, you just say it. So fast forward, you know, my son played a great role as, as Jesus Christ, and he had his other brother play Peter. They were very funny. But when that young boy that played James the Lesser stepped up to that cross and he said these words, he said, all I know is I love Jesus and Jesus loved me. And that sent the whole church on fire. They were just rolling. It's just so we know the Holy Spirit was there. But I'm saying all this to say that within a week after that young man had came on and um, he was, uh, well, well, let me back up. When he was trying to learn his script and we were going through the gospel um, with him, his, I seen his, that's the first time I actually seen real light. You know, the young man just lit up. And he was like, I remember this scene. So nevertheless, after that, he said, I remember reading about this. So it was great to see his light. But then after that, a week later, we lost him. And that hurt me because he was young, around this young lady's age, and we were able to reach out to his mother and do some great prayer of the Holy Spirit. And so now we're back here, and it's like we lost another one. And without him, Israel, we just want to reach out to the family, see what we can do to support them at this time of their bereavement. And um, let them know that Israel here, and we are hurting, but we are here for them. Shalom. All right, Shalom. Thank you, thank you, Ema. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think she touched on a major point, and that and that point is is that uh, it's always a somber time or a somber period when we uh, when we are experiencing this this type of situation in, in the community. A loss, number one, is always hard. But when it's a loss uh, due to some form of cruelty or, you know, allegedly what we're looking at in this situation, it becomes more and more difficult because we know the obstacles that we are facing. And because of that, this this particular situation with Sister Joy is is uh, it's not only touchy. But it's also, like she said, very somber because we are looking at a situation where we aren't able to get all the information yet, right? We're we're we have bits and pieces, and we're trying to put together a puzzle. But we're also looking at a family that is struggling with this, right? That is 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 really in mourning and very sad right now. And like she said, the hardest part is we can't even reach out and put our arms around them. And that was really the the concern that I wanted to address tonight, is the the lack of communication and the lack of unity that we see amongst the body. Uh, as the scripture says, we are many members but one body. But right now, it just seems like we're operating as many members, many separate factions, and and that's really hard for me because when I'm when I'm looking for the go-to, like is it this GoFundMe? Is it this place that we reach out to? Where do we go to get all the information? It's none of that there. And I don't want to attack the particular camp involved right now. But for me, it's difficult, especially as a man in, in, in Zion, right, in the community. And I want to reach out and talk to some of my brothers that, that actually should have the info, have the input, I can't. Right? My wife is asking me questions like, well, what's going on with the young sister? Why don't we have all the information? And, you know, what are y'all doing about it? And all I can say is we're trying. We're reaching out. We're doing everything we can. For me, that's a problem. And that's the that's my biggest issue with this is, worrying about this family and worried about trying to to get this thing cohesive enough to where we don't have to go through this. I'm not saying we won't have any more tragedies, but it's my goal, and I've spoken with several other brothers who we are. We've been putting it together. It's not happening fast enough, but we are putting it together to where when things like this do happen, we have a council in place to address this. And that's that's my plea 
to those that are listening, those that are in a position of influence, those that are in a position of uh, connection with various camp leaders, various ministries, various groups. We need to have some form of communication, especially with situations like this. You know, Ema just brought up another young brother. You know, we have to protect our young people, man. We've got to protect our women. We got to protect our husbands and our fathers, right? Our, our mothers, our daughters. We have to protect the entire community. And right now, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is that we we are dropping the ball. Uh, and, and that's really plea is is that we can come to the table and figure out how to get that thing straight. And if and if we can't get communication, then we can urge people to get away from certain situations uh, that are kind of standoffish from the rest of the community because we do need to be one body. We have a mandate for that to to properly address each other. And uh, what we're seeing right now is that that's not happening. So as as the night progresses, uh, that will be my focus, you know, uh, hearing once again, what the Ema brought out, what Sister Ashanti brought out, what I what I've seen Ema Malaka uh, talk about on her channel, and and everything else that I've seen, and the conversations that I've had in private, uh, is one of those reasons why I've kind of been standoffish and kind of waiting and talking and really digging in, trying to get all the pieces to put them together because, like I said, it's such a sensitive subject right now because we don't have all the details. And I hope that that particular thing, if anything else does not register, we shouldn't not, if we are to be a light and we we are saying that we are ready to be a light, this has got to stop. We should have positive influence, positive control, positive accountability of our gatherings and of, I guess I'll say members, but of our congregation. Right, we are family, we're a body, and uh, and that's my prayer. So I won't be too long-winded on that, because I really want to hear from the guest. So I'll be coming in and out, I'll be chiming in and out. But that's really my concern right now, um, and and I need for some of these strong brothers who I've been reaching out to, begging, asking you, like, come on, let's get let's get a council together, let's get some conversation going. This is it. This is this is the reason. This is the wake up call. I pray. You know, we're still praying. We're still holding out hope until we know everything. But, you know, as of right now, we know what we're hearing in the news. We know what the reports are saying. Um, but I, I would pray that this would be the button as a national cry for us to say, okay, enough is enough. Uh, if we're really going to do this thing, we have to do it correctly. And so with that, um, I will, I'll hand the, the mic over to uh, Ima Malaka, uh, and, and hear what she has to add to the conversation. Uh, Shalom, um, everyone. I, for me, um, because we still are getting the details, we still are trying to understand exactly what took place in this situation. Of course, we're left with, so we have more information, we're left with our experiences we're left with what we've observed. We're left with processing the what if and was it this and was it that. And so there's a lot of speculation going on in the community, you know. And uh, I, in my mind, I, and I'm, I'm just going to be really transparent, my fear is that this young sister is not alive and my fear is that she, her life was taken by someone that she trusted. And my fear is that this person was someone who was possibly operating in a position that one would trust them. So, of course, we don't know that. But like I said, you know, our tendency is to go to the things that we have experienced or observed or fear. And um, when I hear the call for unity, you know, the call for the various congregations or camps and all that to come together, 
I, I think that ideologically that would be wonderful if that could happen um, before, you know, our king actually returns. But I think that practically, and I'm kind of a pragmatic person, practically I don't foresee that happening before the king returns. But what I do hope for is I hope that we could come together on some moral issues where we lay aside doctrinal differences and focus on moral issues because if we can focus on moral issues, we could seek some solutions that could actually make a difference. And so um, right now anything I would be speaking to would really truly be my speculation or my fear. Um, There are some things that I want to share about maybe a little bit more into the conversation regarding the possibility, the possibility of um, domestic violence being, playing a role in this. Um, You know, we don't know that, but I do know from my personal experience, which again, remember I said at the beginning of my my, uh, conversation here that that's what we have to deal with until we know. We have our personal experience, our speculation, our fear. And um, my experience has been that very often it is because she's no longer alive and, and, and very often it's someone close to her, oftentimes someone involved in an intimate relationship with her that is the reason for the disappearance. And um, I want to share that, you know, statistically speaking in the United States, women, so-called black women or so-called African-American women or we might call them Hebrew, uh, the number one um, reason for death in the age group of 20 to 45 is domestic violence. And um, that being said, I can't help but wonder if that is playing a role in this situation. In addition to that, I have thoughts concerning having had many counseling sessions with various sisters who have experienced being in certain organizations where the environment is hostile, or we would call, some people would say, the women of Judah in particular. Um, And so I can't help but wonder, speculate, and fear that what has happened to our sisters connected to that as well. And so, again, I'm not saying that any of these things are accurately the fact. I'm simply saying these are my observations, my experiences, my fears. And so that's really all I can speak to tonight is if that is the situation, these things that I fear, if these are the, 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 the facts that come out, what can we do about it going forward? Because although our sister has not we don't know what has happened to her. If she truly is gone, that means that there's been a life taken from us that did not get to fulfill its potential in in the kingdom on this side, you know, did not get to be the midwife that would deliver the babies in Israel, um, did not get to marry and have children and teach her children to be righteous. And, and so we've got to make that mean something. We've got to make that matter, that I yield. Sis, can I jump back in real quick? Sure thing, brother. No. Because um, Ema brought up an excellent point, and since it's here, she did like a great mother would, and she went on ahead and went to the core of the issue. And uh, since, you know, I always love to follow Ema's lead, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and kind of land back on what she was bringing out and why my plea for unity also has a second part to it. So this possibility of domestic violence, right, this speaks directly to where I was coming from, right? And so now uh, this is me speaking, you know, separate from Sal's platform or anything like that. See, brothers, I've been watching y'all, right? And the issue that I have is a lot of these organizations do have some nasty secrets 
And I'm telling you what I know firsthand from counseling several of these sisters that are coming out of these situations, right? They've reached out to Sal, myself, BA, um, and let us know some of the stuff that's happening. And I'll say this, and, and I'm being very kind when I say this, in a lot of these organizations, there is – what did I say? What was the word I used? Because I want to be very clear with this. There is a uh, a culture, culture of uh, not having a lot of respect for our women. And to me, that's disgusting. Right? I'm just going to be honest with you. And And the reason why I'm crying and begging for unity is because what you're forcing us to do, and this is to anybody, whoever this rock hits, go ahead and let it hit you. Because what you are forcing us to have to do, especially as those brothers that are watching and standing on the wall, that want to see our, especially our young sisters make it home safe. You're forcing us to have to say, well, we have no part with what they are right now. We have no part with what they are into, what they are doing, because we don't even get to communicate with them. Like the email said, ideologically, we differ so much that it almost scares me that morally we may not even be able to come together. That's how far off we are ideologically. When some of these organizations are directing the men to speak to our sisters in a certain way or giving them certain different ways of how to, quote, unquote, discipline their partner, which is nuts to me. Um, If this does turn out to be something of domestic violence, uh, which, if I'm being honest, if anybody that has been around these type of situations, it has all the markings, all the makings of that, then my personal plea then is not unity then, it's complete separation. And the reason I say that is because we work week after week trying to build shows, trying to build relationships, trying to get out here and bring information to the people. But you know what we can't get? We can't get certain leaders, certain organizations to even engage with that. And to me, if that is going to be the face, unfortunately, of who we are, then we either need to hold them more accountable or we say, okay, enough is enough. We done with it because I've been watching this, and I don't. I refuse to allow this to happen as long as me and my brothers, who I know care for our sisters, are involved with this. And I'm letting you know, family, like these type of incidents can be the catalyst to something that puts us all directly in the scopes of the oppressor. Right, and, and, and we need to be very clear about that. I'm not saying attack organizations and everything like that, but I am saying it is now time to be very deliberate and very vocal about what you stand for, what you believe in, our beliefs in Mashiach, our beliefs in how we are to go about uh, bringing this thing to pass, our beliefs in how we are to properly be the light to the world. And losing our sons and daughters is not a way that we are supposed to do it, especially not internally. And I'll repeat that, especially not internally. With all of this big, bad huffing and puffing, there should be an, the, the, the real culture or atmosphere that it should be in there is, no, that's not happening here. And so since it's out there on the table, uh, my suggestion to those that are hearing this is if you are involved with the organization, I don't care what they tell you where domestic violence is encouraged, verbal abuse is encouraged, disrespect is encouraged, get away from them. Right? Now, sisters, that don't give you the right to go fight and argue and yell and fuss and all of that. None of us should be abusing each other. Right? But our sister that is involved with that, please get away from it. 
right? Because like Ema brought out, for our sisters, when you look in that age range, that is the number one cause of death. That is, that is, oh man, that's the same. So, uh, for me, <laughs> and I'm and I'm asking everyone. Yeah, you know, I just say, it, man, make the organization step up or separate from them. I know some people ain't gonna like that, but. Uh, you know, if we can't get any real conversations from you, you've already separated from us anyway. So ideologically, we're so far apart that it is time for this. And and I'll lead that charge if need be. So I'll fall back. All right. That was Brother Anada in the Hebrew making his heart felt plea. Um, still in his spirit, pretty much what the Most High has, has, has placed. Uh, in, in, in his uh, in his ruach to to convey to the audience here to the panel and to the audience those so listening. Um, I want to actually add something and then we'll segue in leadership. Um, I do want to say this as as the situation unfolds, as the evidence comes out, we understand that only certain bits and pieces of the puzzle life and not in the are given to the public. So, you know, as Ecclesiastes says, let's look at the whole matter and then ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide into a sound conclusion. Um, with that being said, I do want to talk about the the group alleged to have some sort of involvement, and that is IUIC, right? Um, I do not want to bash any congregation, assembly, or camp. We know that anytime there's human beings in any type of company, organization, or or anything as such, we know there's there's people prone to make mistakes, all right, even, even in our covenant. The Most High Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, has to put in the ten utterances that thou shalt not murder, <laughs> you know. Uh, we know that these things do happen. They should not happen, but we know they do. One of the first murders is between siblings, blood relatives, Cain and Abel. Right, so with that being said, I do want to say that if there's any involvement or anything, some some information that people may know, or um, the, the the last whereabouts of a, of a, of a of a of a person who was with the with the group, you know that group, hey, immediately come out and say we are cooperating with all authorities, all the officials involved. We do not condone any type of behavior. We're going to um, we give out any information we have. We want to actually we, we, we send our thoughts and, and, and prayers to the family. Those things ought to be immediately said from any of us, you know, because we want to make sure that people understand that we, we stand on the morals, values, and ethics of our congregation, assembly, or organization, right? And that leads into leadership. Leadership being methodical and strategic of how they come out and say things. However, there's things that would benefit being on deck immediately, and that is some sort of um, um, what would you call it? Your 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 public person who comes out and and has something ready to go <laughs> always. You know, I work for a company, and there's always something immediately uh, in 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 some sort of speech. Or in, or in our bylaws that give us some sort of indication of what to say immediately when there's some sort of no waiting on us to come out and give a, a what you call it, a disclaimer on anything, right? So with that being said, leadership. A lot of people are going and saying things about the leadership. They should have done this. They ought to have did this. They ought to have hurried up and said this and said that. I understand our 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 leadership first and foremost when we say leadership are they the men only are they the males only m a l e s are they the males only and if the leadership is being called just the males only what type of things are the leadership implementing as as their 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 standard of operation you know their standard of belief because i know sometimes leadership say hey 
we're 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 the heads. We're and then what I mean by head in that sense is this, you know first century AD definition to me is a different sense. Twenty first century AD says okay we're the head, we're the chief, we're the we're the rulers. You know this is how we're going to run our our uh, organization, our company, our assembly, our congregation, and if the leadership is teaching things that are contrary to functionality, then that may be an issue too, you, you see. So what do we mean by leadership is my question, right? What do we mean by leadership first and foremost? And are we, are we understanding that certain leadership may be having their own standards that may be out of the ordinary as we see fit for leadership, right? And um, I'll go ahead and, and ask uh, Mother Malcolm to chime in and then Mother Maya to chime in. So, Mother Malcolm? Tell me again that was it, what, what the, the question was. The question is, when we talk about leadership, are mm-hmm. we talking about their only males, right? Are we talking about leadership is only males? And when we talk about leadership, what are we saying is required or what should be the standard of leadership when we talk about the leadership should be this, that, and the other, or the leadership should should be this, that, or the other, right? Okay. So I think when we when we're thinking of in this specific context with this specific issue, we would be speaking of a specific camp. And I believe that their makeup, their leadership makeup is male that um, I don't, I'm not aware of any female leadership. And I think if I use that word leadership, I would be referring to those who are involved in decision-making for the ministry. Um, I don't, think there's a female involved in decision making but I don't I don't know that to be the case. Um I think that many of our congregations, assemblies, camps kind of operate uh under that model of not having a lot of, if any, female input into decision making in the ministry and I think that that's tied to um, teaching and doctrine and maybe some possible misunderstanding of certain scripture. Um, a lot of our assemblies or camps and, you know, we may miss the understanding uh, when it comes to the language and the language surrounding women, um, how Yah himself referred to the woman as an Ezer, Kenegdo. Uh, we've reduced that word to mean basically a personal assistant or a servant, when in fact that word is a military term and a word that Yah referred to himself as himself being an Ezer. So I, I think that there may be some maybe westernized thinking about the role of a woman so as a result, we may be missing out on the input that women do bring to the table that can bring more balance, more um, even more even more safety for other sisters. Um, you know, with the the ministry that I affiliate with, we typically prefer that sisters counsel sisters, and um, if a brother is called upon to counsel, typically there will be a sister present with that brother during the counseling. Um, One example of ways that sisters are utilized as Ezra in the ministry that I'm personally affiliated with. Um, So I, I think that when you have one expression of leadership that it's, it's easy to become dysfunctional. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you are in a home and you've got a child being raised and there's only a mother there, there's going to be dysfunction to some extent because children need more mother and father. So when you are in congregations and assemblies where the women are basically silenced, 
you're going to have some dysfunction there. And I know that people are going to say, oh, well, Paul said, I said to the women not to teach and not to preach, and I have not yet once spoken of women teaching or preaching men to men in the assembly. I'm talking about, and I, and I mean, and I know a topic can go into scripture regarding that, whether that's even a valid statement, but, or our interpretation, whether our interpretation of that statement is valid. But that's not even what I'm speaking to. What I'm speaking to is not allowing sisters to be seen in the capacity of of um, honor or a place or a seat at the table. I think that that's not functional because if, if our family, if our if we call each other family and we, we, we have these congregations that we call houses, you know, shouldn't there be the image of male and female because he created them male and female? So that I have on on the subject matter, I think that we have to be cognizant of making safer environments for sisters in our houses, whether it's personally in our home or spiritually in our spiritual places of worship. We have to we have to make these places safe, and one of the ways we can make these places safer is by allowing sisters to operate in their role of Ezra by giving insight into what sisters need and what sisters, um, you know, and in counseling sisters and even in guiding, even in giving insight into decisions being made in the ministry concerning sisters. Um, And then I'll let Ashanti, of course, speak to other things, but that's what I'm focused on right now. We have some ministries that don't even allow sisters to minister to sisters, and, and I think that's not functional. But um, with that, I yield. I appreciate that, Mother Malcolm. And I'll definitely touch on some things, uh, enlightening on um, the, the women and our interpretation of a lot of the um, Pauline or the uh, epistles. The, uh, the new covenant, uh, Mother <clears throat> Mother Maya. Do you want to give your take? And I'll repeat the question. Pretty much, um, when we talk about leadership, we talk about are, are we referring to leadership in only male? And if we are uh, referring to the, the the leadership, pretty much, are or do you think the leadership is is, is teaching sort of? Uh, dysfunctional standard uh, when, when it comes to certain human beings um, in, in this case? Um, yeah, well, to answer that leadership in Israel, we've been knowing us as females know that sometimes, a lot of times out there, there is a lopsided view, and um, a lot of them take it to scriptures when they try and use the scripture, a woman should be silenced and what have you, and um, that disciples and hurt the doors of Zion a lot of the time through the spirit, whereas they want to move and do things they feel that they cannot. And the leadership that is putting down, you know, that way of thinking for the doors of Zion on the day of care, it hurts them. And then to me, that's not effective leadership. The daughters of Zion voices should be heard. So it's always great to um, be able to point them to ministries out there that allows the daughters of Zion to be heard because I'm, Personally, not in agreement with leadership that cycles the voices of the daughters of Zion, because what happens is um, people start to just give away their right mind of thinking. I mean, I was even in a congregation when I was first coming in, and that was the first thing that they said, and I found myself being like paralyzed as to you know what I could say, what I could do, and then it's just. It was an uncomfortable feeling. I was thankful to, you know, be able to remove myself from that because the things that I needed to say, I was second guessing myself, nor would I say them. So yes, I mean, I, when it comes to leadership, we know we cannot just go into a lot of these different camps and what have you, and change their leadership. 
what we can do is can we provide a greater leadership and, you know, kind of like who's going to police the police? Can we create a greater leadership outside of Israel to say that if you are hurting, if you are, you feel like you know you need to get away, you, if things are happening, is there some way that the plea can be heard outside of leadership when leadership is no longer being righteous or if it's not righteous, if it's wicked, um, and, they, and they want to get from under that leadership? Where can they reach out? Who can they touch? Who is there a greater leadership outside these other places that we call camps and churches and what have you? I mean, I think that's my um, greatest plea. You know, if there was something going on and you're on a domestic violence, you know, you can't talk to anybody because they, you know, they are close knit. Is there an 800 number? Is there something that you can call out to to say, hey, look, I need help? You know, I'm trying to come from up under this. I need help. So, um, you know, the, the, I think a lot of them have felt the daughter's dying when it comes to that, um, and I yield on that. Brother and I, we're going to circle back to you. All right, we'll yeah. And, uh, segue into another question if you have one. Yeah, no doubt. I will. Uh, I love what I heard the mother say. Um, well, here we go. Let me go ahead and get myself in some beef. Um, if you out there and you are running around talking about women can't teach, I'm going to tell you right now, first off, and can't shepherd or can't do any of this stuff, you don't even understand it tonight, yet alone the concepts in the New Testament. All right, so if I take you to like, I don't know, Matthew 20. Let me look this, bring this out. Matthew 20, and um, this is coming from Mashiach. And I start at verse, um, I guess I start at verse 25, right? But Jesus called them unto him and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles, uh uh-oh, exercise dominion over them. And Uh they that are great exercise authority upon them. Oh, no. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Guess what, brothers? That that uh, let him be, right? That's a neuter word. I ain't even going to get into y'all grammar lessons. Y'all ain't ready for that yet. Uh, uh-huh. But what you're finding out is the Gentiles exercise dominion over people, browbeat people, and say you can and cannot do this. But what we see was a person like Rachel even tended to her father's flock. She was called a herdsman or a ra'ah. That's the word Come on now. shepherd or pastor. Come on now. Genesis 29 and 9, while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she ra'ah, for she kept them. See, I don't want to be part of no nation that don't want to build up and have a woman uh, helping us build this up. That's not a nation. That's what the Gentiles do. Let's get to the root of uh, of our Emma, Sarah's name, because at the root of her Mm. name is the word Sar. Mm. If you need to understand that, go look in what Jethro told Moses to a point, because I know everybody wants to say we're gods, we're gods. But they were actually called SARS or SARE. Right? That root word of Emissera means um, a captain or a general or a leader. Mm-hmm. When you reduce our women to nothing and saying they don't have any leadership, they don't have any role, you are hindering us. You cutting us at our feet, you cutting us at our neck, you cutting our arms off. You ripping the heart out of this whole thing. And did you hear what the sister said? Like, did you hear what the mother said? They didn't say they want to usurp authority over no man. They said they want a seat at the table. But you'll allow every man that want to fight you and argue with you, oh, come on, Nick, let's, let's sit and let's build. But our rib, our wisest portion 
that just wants a seat at the table, we have a concern about even putting them in a position of of some type of authority or leadership. To me, that's crazy. So, I mean, we can show this in the scripture, but the point of the matter is as, as it pertains to leadership. <laughs> what you're going to mess around and see happen is you're going to see a bunch of Debras get raised up if you're not careful. Because if the quote-unquote men of God are too afraid to sit down and build with those that the creator has given us to build and work with, he'll go ahead and let them do their thing too. And I'm saying that nicely, right? This this thing is set up to where we all have to come together and work out. And I'm going to get off my soapbox. But what I'm telling you is, is, is this concept of leadership is a concept of servitude. It's mm-hmm. not a concept of dominion. That is Nicolaitanism, right? That mm-hmm. is what the Gentiles do. That is not what we do. Go ahead, sis. Uh, I, I'm I'm getting heated. <laughs> all praise to the, all, all praise be to the Most High of Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Yaakov. I really appreciate Brother Anonymous, his, his heart, his spirit, his passion, his love, his concern. And um, I do want to, to to say a couple of things, and that'll lead us into a, another subset of topics that I believe is is scripture. Mother Malcolm brought up, hey, time to, you know, clarify some things in the Pauline epistles. Uh, yeah. What what Anonymous just read in Matthew 20 is one of my favorites. Um, trying to actually uh, uh, be, be a, a dominant, um, what, what you call that, an, an anarchy. You're trying to be solely one person over a whole group of people and that pretty much leads to your abuse, that leads to oppression, um, that that leads to falling by the wayside. So uh, another thing, um, I want to talk about usurping authority. And I usually don't put this out much, but I will. I have put it out. I did some research on the word, the Greek word, that the translator used for usurp authority. Uh-oh. And the Greek word is, uh, yeah, the Greek word is alzentane. It's uh, an infinitive, uh, pretty much, verb. And it actually means, in the context which was going on in the city of Ephesus, you had people um, that were actually trying to take ownership of something illegally, and that was pretty much saying that they were the authors, the creators, the originators of mankind. That was a teaching going on in the first century called Gnosticism. All right? Gnosticism taught an upside down story. <laughs> it actually taught <laughs> it actually taught that that Eve was the creator of mankind or human beings. Right? So that word alpentane or usurp authority, it actually means I don't allow someone or anyone to act as though they were the author, the originator, the creator themselves who formed and made mankind. Because guess what? The Genesis story goes like this, and this is what verse 13 says in First Timothy chapter 2. It says, for Adam was created first, right? The male and the female pair. And then the source of the woman, which is the woman is the man outside of the man, right? So there is no taking no authority from a male in that sense. It's actually trying to take away the creator's uh, 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 initiating of, of, of creation away from the creator. <laughs> Right? It has nothing to do with a woman taking away an authority from a male. (laughs) 
And if anybody That's wants right. to actually, <laughs> if anybody <laughs> wants to um, get some more insight, clarification, or historical reference documents that I have that corroborates what I just said, along with the Greek grammar, hit me up. No problem. However, I said all that to say this discernment. See, what the Most High has put into the, the people who actually call on the Most High and ask for knowledge, understanding, and that wisdom, we're asking for discernment. We're asking for that that keen sense to, to tell the difference or be able to distinguish or be able to come up with some intellectual conclusion on what is actually being conveyed. It's called discernment, right? And we pray for the most. We we pray to the Most High to help us discern which kind of people we should have relationships with, which kind of jobs we should get, which type of house we should get, which type of food we should eat. Right? We we pray for discernment. And I want to ask the panel: Are we going to the left with asking the Most Highway for discernment, especially when we get involved in? assemblies, congregations, or camps, because there have been things put out about assemblies, congregations, and camps, and there's certain experiences that people who leave certain groups actually put out there, and then certain people hear those, and, and they tend not to use some discernment, and then, you know, they make wrong people choices and think they can go in there to the congregation assembly anyway, and they think they're going to be immune to some of the things that have been known to go on, are we putting our discernment by the wayside, right? Or should we actually step up our discernment when we come into this walk? And I'll start by asking uh, Mother Maya, then we'll go to Anonymous Hebrew as a host, maybe, and then go to Mother Maya. Is that okay? That's mm-hmm. fine. With uh, yes, that's fine. All right. Mother Maya, go ahead. Um, I I think that we definitely should, from my opinion, step up our discernment when you're coming into this walk and definitely coming into what we're going to call, quote, unquote, camps and what have you. Because a lot of it, like I said, is what I've seen on firsthand experience is seeing that when I walked in the door it, and I got the understanding of that there was a sense of control there. And um, with that control, you had to give up your free way of thinking and come up with the submission of what they say. And what they say is not lining up when what they say is not lining up with the scriptures, then that's when you should take a pause and say, no, I'm not a follower of man, but I am a follower of Christ. But everybody don't have that proper discernment to say, to say no, I'm, and maybe not even that strength to say that they see things that are not right. But to stand up against, you have to be strong because you have to stand up against a lot. Because most times, when you know with sheep, they they tend to follow. But you 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 just have to stand for the right righteous thing and have the proper discernment to know that if this is not right, I have to walk away. I, I don't care if I walk away alone because what I'm discerning in my spirit, these are some wolves that are in sheep clothing, and if I stay, they will devour me. So. Um, I just think that when we come into this vault, our discernment should increase, and, um, and we should rely more heavily, not on man, but on what does say of the Father. And with that, I yield. Man, y'all about to make me go into a whole lesson on you tonight. <laughs> well, go ahead, my There's some, <laughs> some wisdom going on tonight. Listen, man, Hebrews 5.14 say, but strong meat belongeth to them that are Full of age, or a full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, I could just start running through the whole text front to back as it pertains to how this discernment works, right? But I'm, I'm just going to briefly eat off what Ema just put on the table as it pertains to uh, some of those are not able to discern this, right? And that's what we're seeing right now. Um. Uh, yeah, I said I'm going to stay away from banging on these organizations and getting at them tonight. So I will say this. 
<laughs> as as it pertains to uh uh leadership, right? And and we'll um 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 as it pertains to leadership and, and discernment, right? We have two two factors going on. Those that can discern, do not yeah. be afraid, because the Most High has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit oh, of sound true. mind. Mm-hmm. Amen. So, so if you are in a situation that does not seem right, does not line up with Scripture, and you know it is wrong, mm-hmm. one, remove yourself, and then two, remove everyone with you can get away mm-hmm. from that situation. But you ought to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I don't know. Yeah. Right? Remove yourself with haste, but with discretion until you are in a situation where we can help you. That's number one. And now, those that are on the fence and you cannot figure it out, but something is not sitting right in, you have not because you ask not. Wisdom is given liberally, liberally. It is given freely. It's given to you, to all those who ask. We do not serve this hide and seek, pick a do, pick a boo creator. If you ask, he will show you. If you need to hear a lesson or some understanding, then call us and we will explain to you how you can hear the voice of the Most High because it's not some, it's not hard. But you do have to understand how he will speak to you. And I'll just give you a hint. He's going to come to you through his word, or he's going to give you someone that's going to speak to you, or the spirit will quicken you, and you won't be able to rest for certain things. And you're going to start asking questions. And once you find yourself being very curious and you cannot sit, you cannot rest, you cannot sleep, then it's time to either move and get out of that situation, or you go to someone who has more wisdom to, than you, and they will guide you and show you how to get out of these situations. But yes, discernment is key. Discernment is very key in this present time, and I hate to say this, it is only going to get worse in certain situations. Some of our shepherds are wicked. Yes, it is. I can say it because I deal with them. I know it. And so I'm telling you, if it walked like a duck and it talked like a duck, it's probably a duck. But be careful for the wolf in sheep's clothing as well. Because no matter what, that wolf is still going to drool. It's still going to snarl. It's still going to have some wolf tendencies. And when you see that, then you get away. I.e., follow me. Dominion is mine. Can't say anything. Can't ask any questions. Yeah, that's 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 a recipe for disaster. Yeah, All right. Agree. So, so discernment, discernment, discernment. If you can't figure it out, ask questions. If they will not ask you, allow you to ask questions, reach out to Sal, Asante, myself, BA. We'll lead you. If I can't help you, I so won't hurt you. I promise you. Oh. But we will get you to somebody who can get you more understanding. Oh. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. Mm. Uh, Mother Malcolm, Mother Malcolm, before you go, I want to read the, the passage that uh, Brother Anonymous was referring to. Um, before I do that, I want to say you, you're listening to the big talk. This segment is called Dapple in Trouble, a special tribute to Joy Morgan. You can call in and press the one to talk to any of us or give your thoughts, concerns, questions. The number is 319-527-6239. Again, the number is 319-527-6239. This is Yaakov or James, chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to read verse 6 as well. Uh, It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of Elohim, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. But he should not ask in belief, Right? But but he should ask in belief. Excuse me. He should ask in belief, not doubting. For he who right. is like a wind, but the sea driven and tossed by the wind. All right. So when you when you ask for wisdom of of the Most High, ask in belief, ask in faith, faith of with 
Mother Malcolm, please go and that ahead. Belief, on your take on this belief is an action word on top of that, but I'll just go ahead. Okay. Um, as, as everyone was speaking, the thing that was uh, running through my mind was how I noticed that a lot of folks who come into the awakening are sometimes being led by their emotions and not discernment. Um, and I'm not just speaking of sisters, I'm speaking of brothers also. Um, mm-hmm. It feels good to be in your Hebrew gear and walking with your brothers or your sisters and representing, and, you know, that all feels good. And it, it can be um, intoxicating to feel empowered with the knowledge of who you are and to feel strengthened who believe like you and are standing next to you. Those are good things and those are things that we've not felt for far, far too long, you know. So we desire to feel empowered. We desire to feel strengthened and we desire to feel unified and I understand all that, but those things cannot take precedence over the word of Yah. Those things cannot take precedence over studying to show yourself approved, a workman who's not ashamed. You have to know the word in order to have discernment. If there's not, it, you know, if you think of a computer, in order to get information out, you have to put information in. In order to recognize something is off, you have to know what is right. And if you're being led by emotionalism where you will overlook that feeling of something is wrong because this feels so good to be with my brothers or this feels so good to be dressed in my gear and, and you know, and uh, calling out the Gentiles or whatever it is that I'm doing that I think is a Hebrew activity, you know, if it's, I'm feeding my emotion because that feels great to me, then I'm not getting into the word to discern what actually is there. What is Yah saying to me? What is his requirement of me in my walk? Is he requiring a change of heart, requiring a renewed heart, a clean heart? Is he requiring humility of me? Because the last time I checked, he wasn't really into arrogance and pride, according to his Mm. word. You know, these are things that we overlook because we're being driven by the feel good of the awakening. And we're not doing the basics, which is learning the word and applying the word to our character so that we can hear the Ruach HaKodesh when he tells us, no, don't do that. If I'm in my emotions, I can't hear him clearly. I have to be in the word to hear him clearly. Sometimes we want something so bad, we think it's God speaking to us. I've seen many times, I've had young sisters in particular, who will say to me, you know, I really want a mate. I really want a husband. I'm ready. I want to get married. And I will say to them, okay, what have you been doing to get ready? And they really don't have an answer a lot of times because they haven't thought about preparation. They've thought about the emotional fulfillment that they're seeking. And I think we're no different as the bride of Yeshua because we don't think about getting ready. We think about the emotional fulfillment of what I'm doing right now. And Yah is coming back. I mean, you know, Yeshua is coming back. For a church without spot or wrinkle or a called out assembly. That's right. Obligation without spot or wrinkle. And I'm not going to be that if I don't operate in discernment, but I can't operate in discernment if I'm not learning the word and if I'm not applying the word. Sometimes we're so involved in intellectualism that we have not applied the word to our character. 
He simply learns the word. So that we can miss You know, and so I think we have to go back to the basics. We have to go back to the basics. Um, you know, uh, God says love, right? We're supposed to love our brother. But we don't know what that looks like. Well, how do I do that? Well, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long suffering. Love does not hold account of the injuries. Are we doing that? He tells us that we're to forgive. Forgive so that we can be forgiven. What does that look like? Well, Yeshua said, if my brother offends me 70 times, 70 in a day, I'm supposed to forgive him. But, you know, these are the basics. These are the building blocks to the walk. We want to run and we want to pull out swords and we want to chop off heads and we want to do all these things. But, you know, you got to go to, you got to go to gladiator school first. And gladiator school <laughs> might involve forgiving people who wronged you. Man. You right. know, gladiator school might, might mean you got to get things right in your household with your husband or with your wife. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm just, I'm just throwing out some examples just to say that I think we do need to step up the discernment, but in order to do that, we've got to get in alignment with um, the word of Yah. We have to start applying the word, not just learning it, but applying it. There is no way you can tell me that you're walking in the knowledge of First uh, Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, and you're yelling and screaming at people or hitting people in violence or demeaning or humiliating people every chance you get and using scripture to do it. There's no way you can tell me you have applied that scripture. Mm. You know it, but you're not living it. So discernment starts with recognizing that I can't be led by my emotional wants and needs. I have to be led by what the scripture tells me I need right now, which is to learn how to apply this word to me. It should sure that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Elohim. What does that mean? That means I have to live this thing, breathe it, eat it, walk it, not just think it and fight it. And then if I do that, my discernment will increase. If I'm applying the word, my discernment will increase. God promised us that he sent the comforter who will lead and guide us into all truth. But we have to be walking in his word. He's not going to instruct us if we're off doing something that has nothing to do with his word. And with that, I'll yield. Praise the Most High, Mother Malta, for for your words. If, if I could add to a few things, uh, uh, to a few things you said, um, I'm gonna read First John chapter four, and I'm reading from the scriptures ISR. It says, "Beloved ones, do not believe every spirit, but prove the mm. spirit whether they are of Elohim, because many false born out into the world, mm-hmm. right?" Um, I want to read one more thing, and I want to make a statement. Um, this is Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no Torah. Right? Wait, run it back. Run it back. Run it back. That is Galatians right. chapter 5. <laughs> <laughs> you say run it back. Run it back. <laughs> right? say run it back. Let us also walk in the spirit. Right? Um, I do want to say this. In order to get to know who the most high is, you really have to read the word, study the word, pay attention to the patterns and the ways in which the most high conducts himself. Right, and a lot of people don't know or or develop that personal relationship with the Most High because they don't spend enough time with the Most High. And I know Mother Malcolm mm-hmm. will um, agree with me when I say this: it takes a lot of prayer. 
It takes a lot of conversation. It takes a lot of going in that closet by yourself and pouring your spirit, your heart out. And in order in order to get to know somebody that likes or dislikes, you know, mm-hmm. what 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 they what they uh what they what they dig and what they don't dig, right? It takes the reading of the word. But I noticed, Mother Malcolm, that a lot of our people, even those who want to call themselves Israel, they have not read the scriptures in entirety. They have not read from Genesis to Revelation all the way through. And, and what just they've had done this conversation is, today. Right. Really, that's how the spirit works. What, what we do is we get on social media, whether it be on Facebook, Twitter, and then that YouTube, right? We get on YouTube. And a lot of us, we, we learn in different ways. Yes, some of us are uh, visual learners. Some of us are just uh, phonetic learners. Some of us have to get hands-on to learn, right? But a lot of us, we go to that YouTube. We go from table to table, right, <laughs> out to house, and haven't got a firm Man. grip on the yeah. most highest character, the most highest being, right, uh-huh. to develop that personal relationship. And then you'll know that you are supposed to be following the most high and obeying the most high rather than man. You'll know the spirit of the most high if it's working through man or not. Right. right. You'll know if there's the spirit of the most high Elohim working in a person or the spirit of the adversary working in a person. But you get to know the person by you get to know the person by spending that genuine time with them. This is what I'll say last right. I'm gonna hand it over to Amen. the knowledge. Uh, a cashier, a cashier, in order for them to know which is genuine money and which is fake money, you got to keep mm-hmm. handing them the real thing. <laughs> you got to keep handing them that's the real right. thing over and over again. That's right. right. That's right. And mm-hmm. then when the counterfeit comes, then they know it because they've been that's spending so much time with the real deal all, 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 all this time, right? So a lot of our people, it, I, I, I stress, if I could, I stress, get to know the most highest character in being by prayer, meditation, mm-hmm. but reading your word. Read your word. If you were to choose between reading the word first and getting on YouTube, I say read the word first. Mm-hmm. You know, you can read first things as you go along as you read. I would say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, because, you know, you get on YouTube, even me, I have a channel, right? I have a channel when people say, well, Sharpie, you know, you, you, you're pretty much the professor. You get things to us, you know, in, 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 in a PhD type form, we may not gravitate, understand that we need to be on the milk. You can kind of giving us that meat right now. And I'm like, well, yeah. Because I'm yeah. that time. But if, you, if, mm-hmm. if you're saying that, that means spend some time in your word a little bit more mm. and spend some time in prayer and meditation with the Father. And uh, I yield and hand it over to Anonymous if you've got any more questions for the panel. Uh, yeah, I do. I do have something I want to put out, but I just want to say first, um, hallelujah for this wisdom coming forth tonight. Uh, I'm excited to hear from my sisters. <clears throat> hint, hint. Um, even when I see, she had br- <laughs> hallelujah. He may have brought up something earlier about this, the gladiators, right? And um, so as... Uh, I need to make sure I word this correctly. So we talked about earlier about bringing our sisters to the table. And I'm thinking about this situation with our sister Joy, and I just keep thinking about how we were talking about how, you know, the domestic violence situations and all of this. And so I'm going to present the scenario, then I'm going to ask a question. So, you know, the concern is this especially as it pertains to the quote-unquote masculine principle to the men. Um, Like a lot of what we see happening in the New Testament, as men, we sit back and we debate the scriptures with each other, especially those of us that are truly brotherly. Like, we'll, you know, we'll talk about this thing for hours, just trying to get a little bit more understanding of this, that, and, you know, how deep did we go into... Uh, the tetragrammaton or the Holy Spirit or the Word or however, you know, we, we pull over all of these things. And what I'm seeing happen now, and, and I enjoy it actually, is we are now starting to invite the sisters to the table, right? We're inviting 
our counterparts to the table to have this conversation, at least those of us that are mature enough to do it. Um, but what we see happening is is there is, is this struggle, okay? Sometimes the men, we get aggressive or, you know, we raise our voice or, you know, there's different things. And, and sometimes it gets out of hand, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, you know, it, we all are a work in progress in that respect. But my question is this, is uh, in light of what we're looking at right now and, and even moving forward as it just pertains to the scripture or just in male and, and female relationships, uh, can can the Ema speak to the the need or how to possibly or properly go about the disagreements pertaining to the male and the female? You know, how should this thing be walked out, acted out, especially, you know, from Ema, who I know has been married for a long time. Uh, I know Ema Maya has a lot of wisdom, so um, I know how things happen in my house. Um, you know, we sit down and we talk with some respect, but I don't know how others do it in their home. So how does this thing play out, the the role of the, the man and the woman as it pertains to disagreements? What's the wisdom on that? Well, do we mean like specifically in the context of a scriptural disagreement or just in general? Alon, uh, Mother Malka asked, do you Man, I'm sitting here talking. I had myself muted. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> um, to give clarity, because I, I knew that that would. Uh, kind of get. I'm specifically, especially because of the context of the show, I'm talking about mm-hmm. in a romantic relationship between the man and the woman at home especially. Um, okay. The proper ways, because I, I know what the scripture says, but to hear, I want the sisters to bring this out um, on how we po- we properly are to go about dealing with this as pertains mm-hmm. to the man and the woman in the home. Okay. Okay, well, I'm I'm going to start out by saying that one of the things I always encourage sisters to know and to understand is that women use three times more words in a day than men do. That's a fact. That's a scientific fact. Women tend to gravitate towards language a little more um, readily, um, and they tend to have more words to describe the, how they're feeling, to express what's going on in their minds and their thoughts than, than brothers do. Um, it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with just the way the brain is wired. There's definitely a difference between male and female. We know that. And so I always encourage sisters to understand that you can truly overwhelm a brother with the amount of words you send at him, tone behind the words you send. So I always encourage the sisters to use wisdom with um, the tone in which they're speaking in an argument. And I know that you can get angry and so you can get impassioned and the, the voice can raise and all of that. And so there has to be an understanding that if someone raises their voice, that doesn't mean that um, we now have entered into a free-for-all. That means that somebody needs to remind us both that we love each other and that we're on the same side, we're on the same team. And so if our goal is to stay together and to resolve an issue, going for the jugular, trying to hit somebody in a place that hurts them is counter. So I always caution sisters to not use so many words, to think before they speak, to use discretion. That's one of the values, characteristics of an editor is discretion. You know, um, so... So I'm I'm speaking to the sisters in particular. I think it's important to use discretion, to recognize that you can get your point across, but if if your words are seasoned with anger, bitterness, resentment, um, accusation, if your words are seasoned with those things, he's not going to hear what you're saying. He's going to feel what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And what, what you want is for him to hear you. And you want him to respond to your needs. 
And so it takes a measure of maturity to communicate in that way. And I say if you don't have the maturity to communicate that way, you're probably not ready to get married. Thanks. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw that point out, and if, if the opportunity comes back to me, I'll add something more, but I don't want to take up all the time talking about that. I, I will relinquish to the other Ema. Go ahead, Ema. Oh, Shalom, family. Um, coming to this topic, um, what's first and foremost with me is a lot of times we have not even been taught how to properly function in a healthy relationship. We meet somebody and we're doing the best we can with what we got. We don't. We might come from dysfunctional families and what have you, and then we're not really communi- we, we don't have great communication skills to even get through an argument. So therefore, words come in, people get hurt, and then things build up in your heart even through the years. You don't even know how to let them go. So for me, first and foremost, a lot of people don't think about is if you're with somebody, it doesn't hurt to study them. A lot of times we don't study our mate. We don't. We just living with them. A lot of people just living. We don't even know what their life, what their triggers. We just going by it. But if you take the time and actually study that person and get to know them, really, really, really get to know them, because what happens sometimes in a relationship I found is that I'm the my favorite fruit is a mango. I love mangoes. But then you get to my husband's favorite fruit is an orange. So. When you get into a, an argument, he wants to, he, he know oranges is good. Oranges heal him. But the first thing he wants to give me is an orange. But yet he doesn't know it's not the oranges that help and heal me. I need mango. So, therefore, now you've got a communication breakdown. So, a lot of times, first key is really studying each other and getting to know each other on an even more intimate level, not just existing, going to work, trying to raise kids and go through arguments, get over arguments, make up, and just you really have to get to know the person that you're living with on an intimate level and let them know, no, honey, I need, I, I need mangoes, and you realize he needs oranges. So when an argument starts, the main thing you want to do first and foremost, you want to pray. You want to get yourself relaxed and go before the Father because you need to hear a word, not from you, and maybe not from him at that time or not from her, but relax and go before the Father and let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you as you go because you know that we're not supposed to be speaking out of terms. We're supposed to be quick to listen. And another thing, you don't want to lash back because you can't take those words back into your mouth. And those, word, those words plant seeds and it can, it can hinder relationship even going forward in the future. And you want to respond back kindly if you can. You know, a, a soft word turns away wrath. And then you make sure you want to try and empathize with the person. Put yourself in their shoes. That's a lot of times we're so prideful and caught up into us. We're not, we don't even take the time out to say, okay, wait a minute. Let me flip this thing for a minute. Let me see if I was in his shoes or if I was in her shoes. Can I see it at their angle? And a lot of times when you switch shoes, it opens up your eyes to a whole nother level of understanding. And from there, then you really want to sit down and communicate how you feel. Communicate how you feel, sometimes it doesn't always, it's not always verbal. Some people actually have to take their communication to the paper. They have to write mm-hmm. it down. The point is, it's by any means necessary to make sure that your relationship doesn't get torn or tortured by words of, uh, you, that you get out of anger. A lot of times, you know, they say mm-hmm. sickness bones may hurt my bones, but words will no, words hurt. So, you know, mm-hmm. that, that's the thing I would, you know, in my relationship. And I, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's Shanti. Okay, okay, go ahead, Ima. No, go ahead, Ima. Go ahead, go ahead, Ima. It's okay. Okay. Um, and, and I, I love what, what Ima said because that's so true. And I, I just would say, you know, that the go- you have to have a goal in mind when you get married, you know. If your goal is to just win, you know, then you, you're, you're not thinking correctly. A lot of times when we're disagreeing with our mate, we're thinking about winning, you know. But if they win, I win. If, if they lose, I lose. You know, we're, we're supposed to be a card, one. And so 
the goal of every disagreement has to be to come to an understanding and a workable solution. The goal is not to dysfunction. The goal is to function. But a lot of times, and I'm not saying this like to justify oppression, but I do suspect that some brothers are oppressive towards their women because they fear them on a level of this person can, can hurt me more deeply than anybody else if I let them, if I let them in that close, if I give them um, the ability to, to really know me or to really, you know, get close to me, they can hurt me. And so rather than that, I'd rather, them, I'd rather just control them to have, them to have a real relationship where they can touch me in deep places. It's easier to control. It's easier to just get them to do what I want. Now, that's some people. It's really just all about them. And they don't consider the other person's feelings, emotion, nothing. They just want what they want. So it's really important to go back to the beginning and pay attention to who you're marrying. And then, like the Uma said, study the person that you've married. Because once you marry them, that's who you've got. So now you've got to study that person and figure out how to live in peace with that person. The scripture tells us to pursue peace. And it tells the men to dwell in understanding with your wife. That means you have to know how she's made. You got to know what makes her happy, what makes her sad, what really hurts her. And you don't take the thing that you know hurts her so you win. Not if your goal is function. So with that idea. Sister Santi, do you want to add? Then I'll go. Wow. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Ooh, I mean, diamonds and rubies. Like, good day. This this is going down in history for me. But, you know, and I'm, just, I'm all about relationships, functional relationships, and communication. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, Emma Maya. And Ima Malka said a lot. I just want to add just a teeny bit. Um, a lot of our communication skills are very much lacking. Yes, they are. And this is why I stress um, that in this Israelite community, um, we get back to some sort of um, some sort of teaching, some sort of program where we have processes in order to. Um, to reform our thinking, to, to recondition us into what's functional, um, to get some sort of curriculum for communication skills, right? Because a lot of the times we listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll say that again. That is true. <laughs> and um, I'm good at it. <laughs> we no, I'm you. You laughing, but that needs to be echoed again. Say that. I'm serious. Say it again. I'm gonna say it again. A lot of times we listen so that we can respond. We don't listen so that we can understand. And we're oh. supposed to be listening to understand. You know, um, one of the emails said, "Take your time. Study the person out." I wanted to give you a strong hallelujah, but my son was crying. But hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) Study the person out. And that means take the time to court. However, in the time you take to court, understand yourself first. Understand your family. Understand your expectations. However, make sure your expectations are realistic and practical. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm married. I've been married going on 13 years. There's some things uh, I had standards on. I didn't have high standards. I just had a minimal amount of standards according to me. Okay? Uh, and I, I have a husband, like, who cooks. I say, well, how did you get a husband who cooks, Shanti? I was like, well, that's what he was doing when I met him. Uh, he asked me, well, can you cook? You know? Uh, uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, Another thing is you, when you're courting somebody, you do learn their likes and their dislikes. You learn what triggers them into a negative aspect. And, and two of the best words I learned not to say 
what I want to communicate is calm down. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> Man, that's that's, that's some more wisdom. That's some more wisdom right there. Right. <laughs> oh, girl. Man, right. If you want your household to escalate and turn up, go ahead and tell them to calm right. down and right. the conversation. Exactly, and my. Exactly, you know, Maya and Mother Maka, those two words right there, they start sending people into a fury. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, hear each other out, like Mother Maka said, you're on the same team. I know there's a passage in Ephesians four, um passage in First Corinthians twelve. We 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 are all uh we we all have different functions. Of, of our principal, mm-hmm. of our members. However, mm-hmm. we come together for one common goal. We come together to our manifest this kingdom, right? So um, um, those those are just the, 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 the few things I learned. However, the trigger words calm down. Like Mother Malka said, women, we tend to use more words. And then along with that, we talk fast. Women, we talk fast a lot. Mm-hmm. We're very detailed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like Mother Malcolm said, that can be very overwhelming. And when you learn your mate, when you take that time courting, when you get to know their character, their being, what triggers them in a positive mm-hmm. manner and of that nature, you, you start to actually exhibit that, that loving behavior in your communication. Um, and this is what I'll say lastly. I'm 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 really seeking like like Mother Malka has, which is the only love, um, a, a program where you can assist the women on what signs to look for, what red flags to look for, what 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 things of of a standard and a morality to see in yourself, so that you can see in somebody else, not going off of your emotions and say, "I just want to be in a relationship." But communication right. is because a lot of the times we have we have these filters. There's there's filters, right? And when we're when we're sending out thoughts or receiving thoughts, you know, we have these mm-hmm. filters. We're looking at people according to, um, you know, their religion, their 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 race, their education, their ideology, um, you know, their educational background and, and stance or whatever, what kind of monetary um, um, situation they're in. We have all of these filters, and 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 when we're mindful of those. We, we can be more aware of, of how to approach someone when we're talking, when we're trying to convey or relate a message to somebody, right? So those are just a little bit of things I wanted to add. He, he, the mother Malka and, and Sister Ema hit the nail on the head, um, but I just wanted to add my two mics to the, to the, to the equation there. <laughs> um, but thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. And I yield. Oh, man. Um, could I Go ahead, Emma. Of, there's a couple of programs that we do have in place that speak to what Sister Shanti was just saying. Um, we do have, um, okay, so the ministry that, I, that I'm that i with, Women of the Whirlwind, um, is a, primarily a prayer ministry, but it is also a women's accountability group. And we have a Facebook group called uh, Preparing the Bride, Embracing Biblical Womanhood. And in that group, covered. We cover various topics in the form of units. We actually work through units where we're learning things about what what does a daughter of Yah look like? How do you operate as a daughter of Yah? What does a wife look like? How do you operate as a wife? Uh, these things would involve communication. We did we just we're finishing up going through courtship and betrothal. Mm. How what is the period? What is betrothal? What is what should your expectations be going to the table with the betrothal? Does sex equal marriage? Is that can, can I just move in with him, or he just move in with me, and now I'm his wife? These are the things that we talk about and we study in this group. And um, so, if any sisters are listening and they are interested. And joining the group. Now, what I found is a lot of sisters will say, oh, yeah, 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 I want to know all of that. But if it means that they might have to slow down or put the brakes on something they're already doing, 
then they will just skip these lessons. Mm. Oh, wow. But I want to encourage you to endure the, the pain of self-control now so that mm-hmm. you won't have to bear the pain of self-regret later. Oh, man. Oh, man. And so I'm inviting you to join us. The Facebook group is called Preparing the Bride, Embracing Biblical Womanhood. We talk about the various roles and hats that women wear. We also talk about our personal relationship with Yah. Um, we also have prayer calls and prayer opportunities. We have uh, two two times a week at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We get together for prayer. We also have a Thursday night prayer call called the Welling Women Prayer Call. Um, sisters get on that prayer call and deliverance happens. Um, we also will schedule one-on-one prayer calls where we can actually go into deliverance if you're being bound or oppressed by something in your life, um, some spiritual malady, we can go into prayer and help you break free of that. Um, So those are some long-term solutions that we're putting in place to educate and and build up our our sisters and our daughters so that they can find uh, discernment, so that they can receive that wisdom that God so freely offering them. And then lastly, I want to tell you about three events that are coming up. We have a session, uh, we call them WOW sessions, uh, standing for Women of the Whirlwind. We have a WOW session coming up tomorrow night, um, which is Tuesday, March the 5th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topic is going to be depression, overcoming depression. We have a special guest speaker who is an actor of social work who will be talking about depression in the the community, you know, people of color's community and how we typically don't deal with it and how we can change that and begin to deal with the the depression, how we can overcome that. And then on March 12th, which is the Tuesday following, um, same time, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., we have a WOW session, and the topic is boundaries, setting boundaries and signs of abuse, signs of an abuser. So that will be a session that's happening on March 12th. And then lastly, um, Sister Only Love of uh, Prophetic Whirlwind and Women of the Whirlwind, uh, Sister um, Mayana Johnson of Hanashim and uh, Connect NYC are sponsoring a domestic violence training class session open to the Hebrew community. is specifically designed for the Hebrew community. Men are invited and encouraged to attend. The sessions are going to be physically held in New York City. However, there will be an online session in May that you can attend. So I will be posting a flyer for the the domestic violence training. Um, I'm trying to get the date right in my head. The dates are uh, the first training is March the 23rd. So this Sun, um, March the 23rd, which is a Sunday. All of the trainings in person are on Sundays, and then we do have an online training that you can take from anywhere in the country. So um, I just wanted to put those events out there to let sisters know that if you are lacking wisdom and instruction, you can find Emas and older sisters who are willing to invest in you, pour into you, um, so that you will not make some of the mistakes that some of us have made. So with that, I will. Man, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, man, we just got a whole bunch of gems. So what I want to say is when you go back and listen to this, um, you definitely want to go ahead and, and play back those last 30 minutes and, uh, and really get something. But I'm going to go ahead and give you a uh, a little bit more information overload because <laughs> what the sisters brought out um, – was amazing and um I want to give the male perspective to it and also show you how the spirit works. So number one, um and I want Ema to confirm this, Ema Malaka. I have approached her and she agreed to do it, uh be a guest on my show. Um and we were gonna talk about fireproofing your relationship. Right. Um, and originally I wanted to do it, you know, this week, but uh 
Like I got still got to talk to Sal. Um, I just it's not gonna happen this week. And I know you're busy next Tuesday, so we may have to shoot to do the following Tuesday after that. But we'll talk about that offline. But I just want to show you how the spirit works. Things are in motion already to deal with these types mm-hmm. of situations. Um, the second thing uh, that I want to point out, uh, Ima Maya had talked about a good point about apples or oranges and mangoes. Uh, this speaks directly to what we would consider to be love languages, right? So uh, dealing with, like, my wife and myself. Like, my wife is a communications major. Like, I'm a psychology major and a religion major. And matter of fact, let me not shortchange her. She's a business and communications major. She will get me if I don't point that out. Um, and so when we met, you know, we both had these successful lifestyles, whatever, and we had what I call alpha tendencies, right? We both want to want to run things. We want to be the be the show. We want to run it, right? We I wanted to see certain things done. She wanted to see certain things done, and so the mango and the orange situation really became an issue. You know, we had to take the time to learn each other's language, right? Wow. Um, and it was funny that she talked about writing a letter because my wife does better writing letters, you know. So when it's something serious, she'll write me a letter or she'll text me. You know, me, I'm just going to sit down and talk. And that's just that's how we worked it out until we were able to come to a cohesive um, understanding of how the best way to communicate. So, you know, in, in terms of a relationship, you have to know what your mate needs and what they don't need, right? You have to learn that and bring that and create a safe space. I think it was Emma Malaka was talking about a lot of times when we get mad and we argue, we just want to hurt each other. A word, well, you shot my cat, I'm going to shoot your dog, right? You hurt my feelings, I'm going to hurt your feelings back. You can't, you can't win that way, right? Do you want to be right or do you want to be righteous? And and there's a way to be righteous in dealing um, with a relationship. Uh, and and actually, Emma Malaka has a great book on that, and I'll let her shoot that out in a, in a little bit. Um, but the, it is a wonderful book that can help. Uh, and there's also other sources and resources you can get. Um, please bring this to my members, Holy Spirit. Um, the other point, as it pertains to, okay, so when you come into this walk, right, you will either already be in a relationship or you will be looking for a relationship. If you are already in a relationship, uh, the process is more difficult, right, because now you have to rid yourself of the ways of the world as you grow into this awakening. And so I pray and I suggest that you exercise patience with your spouse, and also you guys need to have uh, what what I call companion prayer time, companion study time, which is you and your mate um, being edified in this word together. So that way you stand on the same page and you're growing together. Uh, if you are new to this, and this is, I, I believe that this is one of the things that was happening um, with our sister that we, you know, that we are talking about tonight. As it pertains to courting or however this situation works, this is courting, proper courting is not a, you know, let's go one-on-one, go for a ride in a car, private stroll in a car, things like that, especially in this day and age, right? If you, especially if you are a part of a congregation, a part of a ministry, uh, there should be proper ways of being set up to court so that way, number one, you're saying safe, but two, there is accountability. So that way you are refraining from certain temptations, right? You are refraining from um, having your eyes wide open on some physical when you need to be worried about what's going on in the spiritual, right? If you're in a group, especially amongst believers who are more responsible, you will be more prone to get to know that person on the inside rather than just knowing that person in the biblical sense, if you know what I mean. Um, Because it is so important to understand the person that you are marrying. 
<sighs> it, I mean, this is one of the. I say this is the biggest decision you'll ever make, right? Uh, other than who you're gonna serve, because as you as you work your way through life, your marriage and your your mate can either be your best friend or your worst enemy. Right. Yeah, right. Well. And and so you have to take the time to properly court. And if you are already married then you have to take the time to properly grow in this with your mate. And if your mate is not trying to hear it, then you have to take the time and exercise uh, what we see, I want to say in Corinthians, about uh, you being the light that leads that mate to this. A lot of times we hear people, well, my mate don't want to uh, study with me. They don't want to grow with me. Well, one, talk to the Most High about that. But two, Ask yourself, am I being the light that I should be? Not saying it's always the case. Sometimes people just don't want to hear it. But you also have to ask yourself, male, female, don't matter. Am I being the light? Because this thing should draw your mate in. They should see a change in you. They should see peace, happiness, joy, all the fruits of the spirit that brings them into this, that now gives this new blossoming into your relationship. All right, so uh, that's pretty much my two cents to it. I'm going to turn it back to Sister Asante. I do have to go because speaking of my mate, I promised that 10 o'clock was my limit tonight. Um, I love you, sisters. I love all my sisters. You know, Ema, Ema Malaka, you know. Uh, Ema Maya, you will get to know. Uh, welcome to the family. <laughs> Uh, thank you, family. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sister Santi, you know what it is. Sal, you know what it is. Uh, Shalom, Ms. Baka. Um, To the family of Sister Joy Morgan, we are praying for you. Uh, we are waiting to know the proper way to reach out. If we can get some more um, um, proper direction on how to help. Um, if the emails have that or Sister Shanti has that, please put that out. Um, family, it is time for us to really start taking accountability, right? I'm going to lead the charge. Uh, that's part of what I got to do tonight. I'm finishing up and tomorrow night putting some things together so we can – so you have one place to go to have access to uh, Sisters of the World win, to a ministry like what Ema Maya is working um, all of the different ministries that we have, we need to have one centralized place where we can go and have access to them. And that's something that I'm working on. So please pray for that, that it will uh, come to fruition. I'm in the final stages of it. So I, I think that will help. Uh, and finally, uh, just stay strong in the faith, family. Right? We are under attack on all sides. We know that. That's what it is every day. Right? So when the enemy fights, you got to fight back. And the way we fight back, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Right? Y'all know the rest of it. So uh, get in that word, get in prayer, get you a good battle buddy, uh, get you a good a prayer partner, and just start growing into this. All right. I love y'all. Shalom. Love you. 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 Thank you enough for coming on for the, for the time um, that you were on. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah, I appreciate um, <clears throat> Brother uh, uh, Nah, that's a righteous brother right there. He said he got to get off the phone because it's time to spend uh, uh, the right, rest of the them. night with the spouse. You know what I mean? That's that balance that's that, that we always talk about. Um, right, and, right. and I want to say, yeah, I want to say thank you to the audience for listening. Um, this is the Big Talk for Use uh, special show, the relationship, which is, is pretty much uh, talking about relationships, but we're talking about Sister Joy Morgan. So the title is. Excuse me. The title is Jackson was Trouble. This is a special tribute, special tribute to Joy Morgan. Um, as Anonymous said, I, I share his same sentiments. I, I send my thoughts and my prayers to the family. Um, mm-hmm. I know there's there's not a lot of people. Um, they're probably trustworthy of. However, um, we 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 do uh, hope for the best. We we do um, want want our sister to to turn up some way somehow. And we we hope that um, everyone who has pertinent information. Work with the officials, work with the authorities, so so justice justice can be served for our beloved sister. And um, um, for those who are uh, calling in, um, we're in the last hour, so the number is three one nine five two seven six two three nine. Again, the number is three one nine 
You can press number one to talk. We would love to hear your thoughts and, and concerns. Um, I know Brother Anon left off with um, talking about courting, and I do want to pose a question about courting um, because I know the, the Sister Joy, um, she was last seen uh, with, with, the, with the individual um, alleged to, to have, have done the, the, the heinous act. Um, um, and the question is, like, and I want to say some more after the question. I'll repeat the question again. Like, how long should you court somebody before you go somewhere alone with them? When, when do you start to implement that trust factor to where you're alone? Um, brothers, like, when, when do you let your brothers off, quote, unquote, a probation period, you know, if, they, if they're known to have been doing things in the past and they're be alone with the opposite sex, you know? Um, and, and I know, like, in order to prevent or be more proactive in, in, in courting, I know there's such things as arranged marriage, right? Um, <laughs> I was watching the Fatal Attraction show. I, I watched the Fatal Attraction show. And, you know, there's there's heinous acts and crimes um, from, from men done to women and, and also from, from women done to men. And there was one show I was watching of Fatal Attraction where um, a person of the Indian background, uh, he married a, a black woman. And they stayed in Atlanta, and and the the Indian uh, man's parents pretty much ended up not liking the 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 wife of their 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 son because she was black, and pretty much um, the the father of the Indian guy was found guilty of having the black woman killed pretty much because saying that hey you're breaking our bloodline you're breaking our culture you're supposed to marry inside of your culture side of your race and side of your nationality. And I know that sometimes people say, okay, we're supposed to have arranged marriages, even in Israel, even in this Israelite culture. And that is because, you know, the families know each other. The children grow up together. You know, they play together. They they, they um, are raised with the same sense of standards, morals, values, and ethics, right? And so when the families know each other, there's, there's an accountability there. Um, the cultures line up. They match up. Um, the expectations are, are there and they line up. So um, to, to, to answer my question that I asked about, about courting, like when, when did you start implementing that trust factor to be alone with somebody, you know, what, what could be a way of preventing that or how could we be more proactive in, in making sure these things don't happen in, in our court? Um, and I'll let uh, Mother Mother Maya go first and then uh, – Mother Malcolm. Um, when it comes to courting, courting. Um, the thing you want to do is refer back to scripture, and I think about you know Sirach six seven. You know, if thou was give a friend, because that's what you start with first, a friend. Um, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. That's where I'm going to start the premise at. It's the first as you're courting him actually giving a person the chance to prove themselves before you allow your walls and vulnerability to come in. So I'm thinking if I had to, um, one of my pressing issues is if you have family members that's, that's of a, you know, a sane mind and what have you with that sense of I, you want to make sure that they are involved in your courting process too. I mean, even if it's not your immediate blood family members, sometimes we got other people that's out in the community that you know that you can trust their sense of discernment because sometimes in the beginning, the things that you need to see, you can't see because you're floating with a whole nother eye of love, but another person may be able to see what you cannot see. And you need those words of wisdom in your ear as you go along, you know? And um, also you want to get to know who their family is as you're courting them. The main thing is before you go through anything that you know you're going to put yourself in a vulnerability recording, you got to give yourself at least, I'm going to put a time frame, maybe a year or so or more. And I say that is because a lot of the times when we meet people, truth be told, you know, tell the truth and shame the devil, we are really meeting what I'm going to call the representative. And as you continue to go on and on and on with these people, you're not rushing to anything. A lot of the times that person can only hold up that representative for so long and it's going to have to go step back into the shadows and then the real person comes forth. 
You know, you have to prove them. Are they willing to be in the scriptures with you? Or what are their goals? What do you know? How do they feel about the Father? What, you know, things that you know, um, you get to find out what is your deal breaker, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So come out, you know, to that, we just rush into things. Take your time because you want to press it to the time where that representative gets tired and go back into the shadows and you see that real person. And, you know, we all know as adults on here, a lot of times we know we don't know anybody until you really get to live with them. We don't want to live with this person, but you want to spiritually live with them so you can finally find out who they really are before you allow your vulnerability to come in. Um, with that, I'll yield. Thank you for those uh, kind words. Thank you for those kind words. Those very important, significant words. I know that they're resonating with me. Thank you, uh, Mother Malcolm. Please uh, give your take. Um, I was thinking about this scripture in Proverbs. I don't think it's fifteen twenty-two, um, where it says, "Plans fail." Um, I think it's for lack of counsel with many advisors they succeed. Or another version says. Um, uh, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Yes. And yeah. that made, I, I thought about that scripture as um, as Ema Meyer was sharing because um, I, I've noticed that sometimes when we're excited about someone, we're less likely to want to hear anyone else's perspective on, on what they're seeing. Right. And that's why, that's why self-control is such a necessary fruit of the spirit what is, you know, I mean, because being able to control your emotions and not to not hook your, as my grandmother would say, hook your your wagon to somebody else's engine too soon, you know, is um, <laughs> it, 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 it takes that's self-control. Real that's that old yeah, wisdom. That's, that's, real. that's that old, right, that country wisdom. And uh, it's, it, it's important because, we a lot of times we are so busy, you know, we meet someone and after two or three conversations we're writing their last name with our last name. You know, yeah. we're making their last name ours. We're daydreaming about our wedding and, and all these kinds of things and um it that's dangerous. It really is because what what we do is we create this false sense of intimacy between ourselves and this person before we know them. Mm. Right. And right. Then we let our guards down because there's an mm-hmm. intimacy there. And I'm going to say another thing that can happen, too, is when we go into congregation or camp and we see someone operating from a position of authority and we automatically let our guards down thinking this person has to be a man of Yah. This person must be, you know, all of the things that in our mind equal a man of Yah in order to be in that position. And so then we automatically let our guards down. All right. Mm. And yeah. so, you know, wisdom is found in a multitude of counselors. Exing your mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, they may not be in the awakening, but that doesn't mean they don't have good sense. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's that doesn't right. mean they don't they don't love you and want the best for you and, and are, you know, that they're not going to be looking out for, for warning signs. Because mm-hmm. if they've lived more than 25, 30, 40, 50 years, they they know a duck when they see a duck. They know a cow when they see a cow. You know what I mean? They can rightly discern the nature or the character of someone that they're observing. That's right. And so mm-hmm. it's important to have not just your peers. I'm not even talking about having your peers giving you their objective perspective. I'm talking about having elders in your life right. give them right. their, their perspective. Someone who's who's been married successfully can tell you what to look for in a man, mm-hmm. what not to look for in a man. Mistaken this whole idea of soulmate, you know, we ooh, I could go on and on about that, but I'm gonna be quick. I'm just gonna say one last thing. Sometimes <laughs> we we make your mistake. Farm, make your farm. <laughs> Sometimes we mistake connection. And we we don't mistake it. We replace character with connection. Mm. I feel a connection to this man. Therefore, I'm not looking at the red flags as a character. Mm-hmm. And so 
if, and if we're looking at culture, and Sister Shanti, you can verify this or, or tell me that I'm wrong, but when we're looking at Hebraic culture, our ancestors were betrothed for a, about a year, mm-hmm. typically. Mm-hmm. Because this gave the man time to go and build a place to take her to. Does that sound like how many I I go away to prepare mm-hmm. a place. Mm-hmm. Right? So the husband mm-hmm. would go and prepare a place, and he would prepare it with the oversight of his father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he had a place to bring his bride to. And while his bride was waiting, she and her companions trimmed their oil. In other words, they kept a watch for when he would return, and they prepared her for his coming. Mm-hmm. And so this, this all went on in, like, the, the space of about a year. And so his character was proven because if he couldn't go and build a home for her, he couldn't take a bride. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he couldn't pay her father the bride price, he couldn't take a bride. And he lived amongst his people who were overseeing him, his father who oversaw him, you know. And so so there's some things that are missing for us culturally because of where we are, this Western civilization. Of course, we've been stripped of all these cultural norms, so we don't know. And then we got people walking around talking about sex as marriage and all these things, you know. And so we've forgotten that women were valued and a woman wasn't just given away freely. Woman, daughter, boss, was considered an asset to a household. And that's Mm. why when a man came to take her out of the household, he had to give her father some money because she wasn't going to be there to to continue to build her father's house. So he was taking her home to build his house. So she was a value. So the father didn't just necessarily just easily give her away. And so I'm saying all that to say that we need to do our best to try to re- try to um, cultural norms within our assemblies and our congregations. We need to find a way to duplicate some of those norms. You know, if a young woman doesn't have an earthly father who's living or present in her life, then the, the brothers, you know, as a council perhaps, need to step up and, kind of oversee a courtship. I've seen that play out, and I've seen it play out very well, you know. So um, I'm not saying that's the solution for every congregation, every every family, but I'm just saying some oversight needs to be given. So when you say how long should a courtship last, a courtship, well, we really did in court like that. We, we you know, so our parents kind of looked to see who they thought was suitable and then we had a betrothal period. And during the betrothal period, the young woman would get to know the young man. And at any, you know, up until a certain point, she could say, no, this isn't a good fit. I don't want to do this. She had to say so, you know. So if we're going to look at how we can duplicate that. Perhaps we need to, when a young woman and a young man are interested in each other, we need to approach the elders and say, we're interested in each other. Can you give us some oversight as we, as we court? And then maybe there's a time frame on how long it takes you to figure out this is someone that I would consider marriage material. And then once you hit that milestone of this is someone I consider marriage material, now we need to get into the betrothal period and what each party needs to be doing during that period. we got to go back to the ancient path, the wisdom yeah. of them, even if we can't do them exactly the, the way they were done. We have to go back to the wisdom of them. And so I, I will you. Sorry, I went on so long. No, that was very, very profound. We, we need to hear every last word, and I, I, I would love always for you to take your time. You know, let, let the spirit uh, move through you and speak. Um, ancient past, that's Jeremiah. Um, Look for the ancient past, yes. We're trying to get back as much of to our original cultures as possible and um, as the most high to fit in this day and age and also in, in the land that we're in. Um, you did touch on a couple of things. I just want to um, reiterate what you said pretty much in terms of Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy. Uh, there, there, were, there were criteria and a protocol for, for uh, it's pretty much a, a man wanted to marry a woman. Uh, All right. He had to go he had to go to the father. Um, 
pay a dowry, go through a contract, pretty much go through a time of, of, of getting found out, you know, of, of if he was going to be um, an eligible suit for uh, for the daughter, you know. And sometimes the father can definitely refuse, right, as we see. Um, my sister Katrina couldn't make it uh, to tonight's show. She has to talk. I do want to share her thoughts here. Um, she did uh, reiterate a lot of what you said, but she says there's too many sisters uh, who follow, who, who too many sisters who don't follow put all of their trust in, in men. Um, they're doing everything that their leaders tell them to do and not what the word and the ruach tell them to do. Like uh, pretty much test the spirits, by the spirits. You have to try those sisters, right? Um, right. Um, it's not just enough for somebody to, to show things on the outward, like, you know, wear fringes and keep Sabbath in the few days and pretty much know how to memorize scripture and finesse scripture and throw scripture out, you know. But if, you, if you're not exhibiting those fruits of the spirit, if we're not seeing certain things in your actions, your, your behavior and your conduct, then you just pretty much going through the motions, right? Um, and uh, no, sure. we, we have to pretty much just to have to keep our uh, um, – Elders, our leaders, whoever they may be, accountable. Uh, she said it's a lot of wickedness going on. People turn a blind eye and and are hushed about it because they don't want to be seen as the one rocking the boat. So pretty much we have to put our faith and our trust in the Most High Yahweh and not men. We have to not be a respectable person. You know, we have to stand up for righteousness, right? For all um, she also was saying that uh, in the case with uh, Sister Joy and Morgan. There's, there's a lot of speculation because, like, we, we don't have all of the information. We're not privy to all of the evidence. Um, every, you know, everybody who's supposedly involved may not be cooperating 100%. Um, this, this was a, a, a sister who had a great reputation, right? Uh, she was going to school to, to be a midwife. And right. um, she was pretty much just, just going to her congregation, trying to um, – to be the best creation her most, Yahweh, most High Yahweh created her to be, you know. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, um, I, I just I just pray that uh, the sisters remain a show and that the family gets some righteous closure. Oh, no. I, 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 I sympathize with the family. Um, I, I know pretty much most of us know how um, painful and sorrowful loss is, you know. Um, Right. The loss of a lot. You, you pretty much see a 21 year old person and you believe they had a lot more life to live. Right. So um, it, it, it's a sad thing in, in Israel. This should not happen. However, this should be a wake up call. This should be a so far horn blast that we need yeah. to get it together, that we need to pay more attention, um, and, and that we need to seek the most high. With, with all due diligence, right now more than ever, right? Um, so pretty much um believe we have any callers pressing the one, and and uh, we're going to wrap this thing up. I, I really want to say all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High Yahweh that we have this platform to come out and, and, and bring the situation to light. And, and bring some positivity to it. Um, take heed from it, right? Um, okay, we do have a caller. We do have a caller. <laughs> Somebody want to get any last words? We appreciate the, the callers. And then we'll take the callers, and um, as they come in and as they wind down, uh, Mother Mother Maya and Mother Malka will wrap it up after the callers uh, come in and, and, and say their piece. All right, Sal, go ahead and let the callers chime in. All right, we're going to the phone lines. Let's go to 469-245. Shalom, shalom. Hey, Sister Shanti. How are you doing? Good. Shalom, shalom. How are you? What, what's your name, sis? Tika. It's Tika. Tika, what's happening, Tika? <laughs> Thank thing. you for calling in. I, I heard uh, some of the conversation, and... Um, I do want to concur with Sister Katrina um, as far as people following men and 
you know, we have to all realize that we're on a walk, we're on a journey, and we have to respect when people um, differ from one another and differ from, you know, each other's faces and stuff. And so, I mean, I, I was talking today, like, you know, y'all is doing the separating, y'all is in control, and and sometimes those things need to happen so you can get to your next level. It has nothing to do with your love for that person or, you know, how much you wanted for that person. But if we learn to, you know, love one another in a respect where we understand that they're on their personal journey and God will take them where they need to be and that we cannot stand for one another, you know. Nobody can stand for anybody in this world. And as long as we understand that, and we keep that in mind, and we keep moving forward, then we're all be the better for it. That's, that's all I want to say. I appreciate you saying that, She, um, We know, and we always talk about in, in the day of judgment, there's not going to be any other individual standing around us, front, back, or either side. It's going to be us and the most high alone, right? <laughs> and we're going to have to give an account for our individual choices that we make, right? So I appreciate you saying that. Um Mother Maya or Mother Malka, you have any um, last closing remarks? Mother Ma- Mother Maya, you can go first. Um, I just want to say, number one, thank you once again to you for inviting me on to be part of such a great platform for what we are experiencing in, right now in the days of Israel, especially when it comes to this beautiful tribute to our daughter of Zion, Joy Morgan. I just wanted to say, you know, and I definitely want to um, – Tell Mother Malaka, I really, really commend what they are doing um, with, I think, the Wild Ministry because we need that in Israel. And I'll be more in contact with her to get more information about that as well. But um, mainly the plea goes out to the daughters of Zion, even the sons of Zion out there, that if you feel that you are being oppressed or in a situation that you are threatened, please, please. Do not hesitate to reach out. We have people out here that is willing to take you, willing to lead you, and willing to guide you. But you got to do just what those four lepers did in Second Kings. You got to get up. And when you get up, the Father will multiply your footsteps and get you to where you need for your salvation. You don't have to stay in any oppressed environment because that is not of the Father. And if anybody is threatening you in any physical violence and what have you, I'm sorry. Please understand that that is not of the Father either. Get out of that situation. And with that, I'll say I want to, you know, I think the thing to who was the brother um, anonymous, I really, really would like to link up with him as well as he's trying to build something for them as they outcry and they reach out for help. We need to have a pillow out here, and I'm willing to come along in a lot aside anyone and roll up my sleeve to make a pillow for the community, for people out there that find themselves in trouble due to poor discernment and just a yielding of want to be in the truth, but yet their lives are at stake. It just takes me back to 2015. I remember when Sister Janice Lawrence, she lost her life. You know, we got to do something, Israel, and I appreciate me being here. I'm at least looking at the start of what we are starting to have some sort of outreach for our family that needs to reach out for us for help. Um, with that, I'll just say I yield, and I love everyone. I'll keep everyone lifted up in prayer. And please, 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 if you can, go to the go, go, GoFundMe.com, Joy Morgan, and look for Rhoda Small. She's the one that's in charge of the that's – the, that's, the, that's the one that, that GoFundMe that's linked up with the family, and give if you can that way. I really appreciate it. Shalom. Uh, Shalom, family. I want to thank um, Sister Shanti for inviting me to be part of the show. Thank you, Sal, for the platform. Um, Thank you, Brother Anonymous, for all of your insight and and just uh, your clear vision. Uh, Thank you, Ima. Maya for sharing um, the time with me. I enjoyed your insight. And uh, I just want to to extend condolences um, 
to the family of Joy Morgan for going because of what you're going through. Um, I'm hoping, praying for a safe return of our sister. Um, And I'm praying for your strength in the midst of this trial. And um, I hope that we do find a way to reach you to extend the love of the people who call themselves Israel um, so that you will know that there is love here, that there are people here who are striving to to live upright before Elohim and, um, you know, that you can see that 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 Joy's life matters to us. Um, and in closing, I would say to all the family, um, those sisters who are listening, um, I encourage you to get wisdom, to get understanding. It's available to you. Um, we live in an information age where even scripture is just at your fingertip. Most of us have two or three Bibles laying around. Don't be deceived. The spirit of truth is present for you and available for you through the Ruach HaKodesh. And and all we have to do is ask Yah for wisdom, read his word, stay in um, the fellowship of his Ruach, you know, and he will endow us with understanding. Um, I agree with what Sister Katrina said about putting a man above the word and above Elohim himself. That's a dangerous thing to do, sisters. Before you are the bride of a man, you are the bride of Hamashiach, and and there are uh, responsibilities that come with that. And one of the primary responsibilities is to take care of yourself, because your body is the temple of the Ruach Hakodesh. And so, reach out for help, as my sister um, Imamaya said. Don't suffer alone. Don't suffer in silence. Reach out for help. Therefore, who will help you if you find yourself in, a, in a, a situation where you're being abused or oppressed? You can reach me directly at womenofthewhirlwind at gmail.com, womenofthewhirlwind at gmail.com. Um, and with that, I'll say, Lila Tove, Shalom. Lila Tove, Love you